Welcome to today's webinar, everyone. Uh, it is, it's called In an Introduction to Reconciliation. My name is Liz Weaver, and I'm the co-CEO of the Tamarack Institute's Tamarack Learning Center. And I'm here to introduce our discussion today with uh, Charlene Seward of Reconciliation Canada. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Charlene. Charlene is a proud member of the Squamish Nation and brings almost a decade of experience working and volunteering with local nonprofit organizations and small businesses to the Reconciliation Canada team. Charlene is wholly dedicated to First Nations rights, reconciliation, and food sovereignty. Welcome, Charlene. We're really pleased that you're, you've been able to join us today, and uh, we really look forward to your presentation. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Liz, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm excited to spend the next hour with you today talking a bit more about reconciliation, what it is, what it looks like, what it feels like. So I'm going to start this morning um, by acknowledging that um, I'm currently sitting on the territory, uh, the traditional unceded territory of the Squamish people. I know that people are uh, joining us from all over the country, um, but I like to acknowledge that this is where I'm seated and I'm uh, happy to be working on my ancestors' traditional lands. So when Reconciliation Canada first started in 2012, um, we started from the vision of Chief Robert Joseph and his idea that, um, or his dream more so, that 50,000 people were walking through the streets of Vancouver in the spirit of reconciliation. Before we did this work, uh, we spent a few days, we gathered elders from diverse backgrounds um, to talk about the language of reconciliation. Um, and the core principles that sit beneath that. So we're going to take a moment, and it's a very short video. Sorry, I'll, it'll just be a moment. This is a historical moment for all of us for being in this great house today to gather your wisdom, to gather your strength, to gather your ideas about reconciliation. Reconciliation is recognizing that a harm was done, that taking young children from their homes generation after generation for over a hundred years was wrong. Denying these uh, children the ability to learn their languages was wrong. That treating them abusively was wrong. In our naivety, in our stupidity, in our arrogance, we have made many mistakes. There's thought far too much hurt and pain and loss in our community. Far too many kids taking their lives. Far too much poverty and despair. As a survivor of the Holocaust, I feel that it's very, very important that we leave a legacy, that uh, we inoculate people against hatred and discrimination. Must stop is healing a wound or healing a hurt or healing a, something that happened. Must stop. I would like to see this huge injustice brought to light. A reconciliation for Aboriginal peoples must be done well. It means that we have to acknowledge our history together, that indeed these harms were inflicted upon the First Nations people of this country. What our complicity in all of that was. I don't know how we can go forward together without those kinds of acknowledgements. Moving forward means to live a good life. Long time ago, our people lived a good life. Every day was a good day. We cheat ourselves out of a full, rich life if we're not willing to take the risks of reconciliation. Well, first of all, I think we really need to 
get the message out. We're calling on all Canadians across the spectrum of our society to become engaged because it's necessary for them to validate our experience and for them to embrace the notion that we can vision a future together as a society, Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal. Because the past repeats itself, we can try to change it. We don't want that to happen again. In September of 2013, we're going to have a huge gathering in Vancouver to talk about reconciliation and to celebrate the idea of reconciliation. Become informed and to reflect and to help make decisions about what is proper redress. Another word for reconciliation is courage. means to hold each other's hands and in holding each other's hands, there is no room for harm. It's up to all of us now to put some justice in all of us, to put some love, to some, some care. The ultimate goal and objective of uh, reconciliation is to find nakalkala, peace within. All right, so when we talk about reconciliation, there are a few things we need to address. The first and foremost being that we need to start off by acknowledging our shared Canadian history. And that really sets us up to understand our present reality, um, how our communities operate and why they operate in the ways they do. All of this is to ensure that we are able to create change um, together, really. And we do this in the spirit of Namoyut. And Namoyut is a Kwakwala word, and it means we're all one, we're all family. So Reconciliation Canada is an Indigenous-led charity. Our goal is to catalyze meaningful relationships through values-based dialogues, leadership, and action. We welcome everyone, um, and we believe that everyone is needed. It can't just be Indigenous people working to push reconciliation forward. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time sitting with this. I know we do have a short amount of time together, but I feel it's necessary to go over a little bit of our shared Canadian history. We call it our shared Canadian history because whether you've been here uh, or whether your family has been here for 10 generations or you're a first generation, as a Canadian, this is a history you've inherited and it's a part of your history now. I won't start at contact. Um, we're going to start in 1876, and this was the year the government implemented the Indian Act. So essentially, the government of Canada assigned responsibility for Indigenous people. Um, we were no longer individuals, no longer adults. We were wards of the state. And that meant the government decided who was Indigenous and who wasn't, and where we lived. We were moved from large pieces of land, often to very small reserves on barren land. It changed our entire way of life. In 1884, the government enacted the potlatch ban. The potlatch ban also included the sun dance and the ghost dance. Um, what we need to understand here was that this process, the potlatch wasn't just a spiritual ceremony, it was our way of governing ourselves. Um, you know, through potlatches, we celebrated marriages. We honored the deaths of those in our community. Um, you know, we were given our names and titles. And so a lot was lost with this uh, potlatch ban. Indigenous people who were caught um, potlatching were arrested and put in jail. And our ceremonial items were taken away and either destroyed or sold off to collectors across the world. So in 1911, the government decided that reserve lands could be taken away from bands without their consent. And more so, in 1927, an amendment was made to the Indian Act to ensure that we were not allowed to bring action against the Canadian government or raise funds to hire a lawyer. And 
1914, it was also made illegal for us to wear our regalia unless we had a written permission slip from the Indian agent. All of this culminated with the building of residential schools. So residential schools had the mandate to kill the Indian in the child. Over the course of just over 100 years, 150,000 Indigenous children were stolen from their homes. We say stolen because a lot of times they didn't go willingly. Um, if parents didn't want to send their children to school, if they tried to hide them or if they tried to run, the parents were put in jail and then the children were taken and put in these schools. There were 140 Indian residential schools across Canada and these were funded by the federal government and run by Christian churches. The first school opened in Mission BC in 1861 and the last school in Canada didn't close until 1996. It doesn't feel so much like history when you put it like that, I think. Um, I would have been in grade six that year. Um, so it seems very real, very present. Children at these schools were kept for 10 to 12 months a year. A lot of them never went home for summers or Christmas. Um, you know, they were brought to the school between the ages of four and six and they stayed there um, for years, for decades, um, you know, up to 15 years. Abuse was the norm. Corporal punishment, sexual abuse, neglect, starvation. Indigenous children were forbidden to speak their languages or practice their culture. All of this was to ensure that there was a disconnection created from the family, from the community, from the language, and from the culture. So in the early 1900s, the government of Canada sent um, a medical inspector, uh, Dr. Peter Bryce, across the country to find out what was happening, what was happening in residential schools. And he came back and he reported that 50% of the children who passed through these schools did not live to benefit from the education which they had received. Um, it's hard to note that until 1910, these schools weren't required to record anything more than the gender and age of the child who had passed away. Um, and across this country, there are unmarked graves of children. This was a system of cultural genocide against Indigenous people, a system meant to ensure that our cultures and our heritage and our traditions wouldn't carry on. We see this come through in so many different ways today, the intergenerational trauma as this transmission of historical oppression. Um, you know, we go back to that year 1996, we're not very far from this system. Um, to be honest, I'm one generation away. My parents are day school survivors. And we see the intergenerational trauma play out in a multitude of ways. Um, for example, there are more Indigenous children in care right now than there were at the height of residential schools. There are over 1,200 missing and murdered Indigenous women across this country. We're overrepresented in the prison and justice system there's rampant alcohol and drug abuse within our communities. And it should be acknowledged that we're still going through a suicide crisis. I guess that brings us to the question of what is reconciliation? And I think the first and foremost thing we need to understand is that everyone will eventually come up with their own definition of reconciliation, their own understanding of it. Um, reconciliation is first and foremost an internal process that we work through. As, a or as an intergenerational survivor, I view reconciliation first and foremost as healing, um, as creating space to work through that intergenerational trauma. Um, and for non-Indigenous people, reconciliation will mean something different. 
and your definition of reconciliation will change depending on where you're at within your reconciliation journey. I think the next question we get a lot is why, why reconciliation? My answer would be that there is no other choice for Indigenous people. We need to learn to create a better future, a better society, not just for ourselves, for our children and our children's children. I want each and every one of you to take a moment to think about what reconciliation means to you. And more so, what has your experience of reconciliation been? Have you had any experiences of reconciliation? And next, why is reconciliation meaningful to me? So, as I mentioned, I'm an intergenerational survivor. My parents attended day school and their parents attended residential schools and so on and so on until the 1800s. Um, and this has really uh, defined who I am as a person. It's um, shaped me. Reconciliation is meaningful to me because I don't want the next generations to suffer through the same intergenerational trauma that ours has. I want to know that all children feel loved and cared for and looked after. Um, and to me, this goes back to my own experience with my daughter um, and my dealings with racism as a child. So before we close, I'm going to uh, take a moment to talk about a few of the key components of reconciliation. Um, the first being optimum potential. So optimum potential is about creating value and purpose. It refers to one's ability to explore the notion of self-fulfillment and to actualize their highest self. Encouraging an individual to reach their optimum potential begins with a sense of dignity and the ability to seek inner peace and prosperity in many ways, socially, economically, politically, and spiritually. The reality is that the landscape that Indigenous children live in today doesn't allow them to achieve their optimum potential, and it's our responsibility to create that opportunity. Achieving optimum potential requires challenging preconceived notions of one's abilities and purpose, and encouraging individuals to grow and thrive with their innate skills and gifts. I think the second, um, the second one is very relevant now and it's on a lot of uh, people's minds regularly. It's shared prosperity. Uh, so this notion of economic reconciliation. Um, shared prosperity is about inclusion and the ability to overcome economic inequality in Canada. It takes a values-based approach that supports the development of sustainable wealth for Indigenous people and all Canadians. It's a reality that a majority of Indigenous people in Canada don't have access to the systems that allow for economic stability and sustainability. It prevents individuals and communities from realizing their best self, and it undermines their ability to achieve their optimum potential. So this idea, this notion of shared prosperity, it requires us moving from our current transactional economy toward a relational economy that honors individuals, it honors families, um, and organizational and corporate forms of financial, social, cultural, and environmental capital. It'll also require the development of meaningful partnerships and identification of achievable goals, as well as, of course, a strong commitment to maintaining the momentum of Canada moving forward to reconciliation. I think in order to achieve these two, we need social and systemic change. So when we talk about social and systemic change, what we're talking about is a way of being that requires individuals and societal shifts toward an increased understanding and knowledge of our shared Canadian history and understanding between the relationship between colonialism and our current realities for many Indigenous people in Canada. 
and an opportunity to weave together the unique and diverse strengths of people from all backgrounds in order to find a new way forward. I think social and systemic change will require individual and societal shifts that are supported by systemic change initiatives that take shape through institutional growth and progression, public policy and practice. So, uh, Charlene, thank you. That gives us lots of food for thought. Um, for me personally, I found um, the history that you presented, um, not that I didn't know the history, but when you present it the way that you did, it, it is uh, something that is not only history, as you said, but is kind of a very uh, close reality. 1996 wasn't that long ago, as you mentioned. And I, I, I think I also, you know, have been reflecting on um, both the personal work of uh, reconciliation, but also the shared work of reconciliation. So I want to thank you for your presentation today. Um, we're now going to move on to the question and answer part of our call. We're going to begin with some of the questions that were submitted in advance. Um, but we also encourage you to send us your own questions or your comments. Um, uh, through the con uh, question box on the control panel, and we'll do our best to get to all of them. But I want to start off, uh, Charlene, with one question. So what does reconciliation look like um, as day-to-day -day practice? I think that's a wonderful question. Um, so reconciliation um, is first and foremost a way of being, a way of living with other people. How do we um, internalize that? We come to everything we do with an open mind and a heart. We let go of these preconceived notions we have of each other. Um, you know, what I think we really have to start understanding is that even if the government were to fully implement UNDRIP right now, even if they were to fully implement all of the calls to action, it wouldn't change the way we relate to each other, the way we speak to each other. Um, and that's what needs to change. And that's so much. It, it starts internally. It starts with you. I think that's a really that's really insightful. And um, so the second question that I wanted to ask, or that uh, uh, someone submitted in advance of the call, is what's the most important contribution that individuals can make to reconciliation? Which I think builds on the first question, but I think it's also a really important question to consider. Absolutely, I think that everyone, of course, has a role in reconciliation, and that everyone is needed in this movement. Um, what is the most important contribution a person can do? It's rededicating yourself every day to this notion of reconciliation, um, learning to embody it and live it as a core value. Um, and understand that reconciliation doesn't have to be this daunting giant task. It can be something simple you do every day to give back to your community, to your family, to your friends. Um, at Reconciliation Canada, um, if you go to our website, you'll see we have um, in the resources section, um, a back pocket reconciliation action plan. And we ask everyone to fill one of these out in order to find one simple way to move this reconciliation movement forward every single day. Um, and I'll tell you what mine is. Um, my back pocket reconciliation action plan is to hug my daughter every day. And it's to tell her how loved she is, how intelligent she is and how important she is. As an intergenerational survivor, that wasn't something I was given as a child. Um, and, and that's quite common um, to not have the words of affirmation or physical affection. Um, but it's up to you to find out what your sphere of influence is and how you can incorporate reconciliation into that. So we have a question from Lorelai. Uh, her question is, I really appreciate your mention of the need to move away from tr uh, transactional economics as part of reconciliation. Can you recommend resources that would enable her to learn more about this or any of our listeners to learn more about this? So the thing about economic reconciliation is that it's, um, it's very new. It's um, still forming 
and we're all still kind of discovering it as we go. In terms of resources, um, that's a great question. Maybe start by, hmm, sorry, you'll have to give me a minute. No, that's okay. It's, uh, <laughs> I think people who are interested in terms of, you know, how can we think about, you know, spending our money more wisely, uh, looking at it as a means of uh, kind of changing the world as opposed to just the transactions that we take. Absolutely. And I think it goes back to that, you know, you vote with your dollar. Every, um, every dollar you spend supports or destroys the... Um, the ideals that you live for, that you support, that you that you incorporate into your life. Um, similar to how Michael Pollan says, you know, you vote with your fork, I believe very much so that everywhere your dollar goes, it it can either be invested into good or um, not. Yeah, I, I think it I think it reconciliation, you know, what I'm thinking about, um, Charlene, in terms of this conversation is that it is uh, kind of intentional personal actions that we can take but also the understanding of um, our history and the the trauma that has um, that has happened in this history so I think it's, it's, it just seems to me that those are two really important pathways um, we do have a couple of other questions that are coming in so I'm gonna um, raise Raymond's question so Raymond asks, of the main church denominations that were involved in running residential schools, have they, have they provided a formal apology? And are any of them supporting uh, reconciliation initiatives today? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so a lot of the churches have provided a formal apology and um, I can't speak for all of the churches and everything happening across Canada, but I can say that there are definitely pockets of support. Um, and I think reconciliation is really happening in churches now. I think it's being embodied. Um, how are they supporting it? I believe that some churches are supporting uh, the reconciliation movement financially and some are creating space for healing and dialogue on this challenging issue. Thanks. Uh, Navreen has a question. So she works in family reconciliation and preservation. How within uh, the role of her team uh, that the how within the role my team plays with families, which is often mandated, can we start the journey of healing and reconciliation and show genuine care and understanding towards the families that we serve? I think that reconciliation can be incorporated into everything that we do, um, in particular family reunification and preservation. Looking at how we can support um, healing from intergenerational trauma, what resources are available. Um, as I've never worked in family reunification and preservation, I'm not sure what that looks like exactly. Um, but I would ask uh, Navreen that you look into what resources are available to support Indigenous children, Indigenous families. Um, and it could be as simple as starting an, an open dialogue session on, you know, um, what is healing? Um, what does family mean? Jade, uh, JD has a question here, um, and it's, a, it's an interesting one, so she gives a little bit of background as well. Um, what responsibilities do you think non-Indigenous people have, and what can they do in regards to cultural continuity and respect for Indigenous culture and practices? And she goes on to say, I'm a curriculum developer who develops curricula for youth in the justice sector, and I recognize that many of the curricula I develop will be used by Indigenous youth, and I want to ensure that what I develop recognizes their cultural needs 
and a recognition of the impacts of intergenerational trauma and continued colonialism. So she's um, a person, I hope JD is a she, um, but uh, this, uh, this person is um, uh, identified, you know, a role that they play in a really wanting to, to consider how as a non-Indigenous person, they can bring, you know, this into their work. Yeah, um, absolutely. Thank you, JD, for um, your question. I think it's a lot of it is about relationship development. So, JD, I would ask, uh, who are the nations that surround the area you work? Um, who can you develop partnerships with? Who can you learn from? Um, I think this is a journey we go on together, and I'd recommend you don't do it alone. You know, seek support, seek help um, if you want to ensure that your programming is culturally safe. I would ask that you re reach out to elders, um, reach out to our knowledge keepers, and ask them what you what they would think is best. Uh, Trish has a question. Um, how do we how do we keep the conversations about reconciliation authentic and avoid it from feeling like tokenism? I think the biggest part to keeping these conversations authentic um, is first and foremost including Indigenous voices in the process itself. Uh, Reconciliation Canada is an Indigenous-led charity and we see that as critical to our work um, in terms of keeping the conversation authentic. It's I know a lot of people fear tokenism, um, and we hear it all of the time. People are unsure whether or not, um, you know, even a, territor a territorial acknowledgement just feels like tokenism or a checkbox. Um, it's what's underneath that that's meaningful. Um, it's the intent and the continued relationship development that makes it relevant and makes it important. I have a question, um, Charlene, that I'm going to ask. Uh, how how can Reconciliation Canada help support um, uh, individuals like Trish and others that are listening on the line? What tools and resources might you guys have that um, can be helpful or uh, um, helpful on this kind of journey of reconciliation? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so Reconciliation Canada has numerous resources on our website. Um, we do have a few video series. There are toolkits, so you can go onto our website and download a Reconciliation Dialogue workshop, tool, a workshop Toolkit. And this walks you step by step through how to run a Reconciliation Dialogue workshop. If you're not comfortable with that, feel free to reach out to us. We can come in and run a Reconciliation Dialogue workshop workshop with you. We have speakers available. Uh, we provide lunch and learn services. Um, yeah. So there's a, a range of resources. Do you have also um, connections? I know there are reconciliation groups in places like Saskatoon and in other places. Do you have connections to um, local groups that might be leading this work in a variety of different communities across Canada? We're in the process of developing relationships across the country. Um, right now, we're based in North Vancouver, but we do our work nationally, and uh, we try to reach out and form partnerships uh, wherever possible. So maybe starting with you and then seeing uh, where some connections might lead or some suggestions might lead is a really good step. I've got a, a question here from Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca's asking, what are your recommendations if a social service organization wants to take action, but there is no elder or indigenous leader in our organization? It doesn't fair to rely on a handful of indigenous staff to lead us or represent. Um, so they're looking for how do we, how do you, what's your advice around reaching uh, further out? Um, I think it depends on the area you live, Rebecca. Um, I, I'm grateful that you don't want to tokenize your Indigenous staff um, to lead or represent you. I would say, once again, it's about partnership development and relationship development. So who can you reach out to? Who is in your area? Um, you know, do the local First Nations have an elder that they would be able to um, 
give you his contact information? Do you have, um, you know, is there a friendship center located nearby? Uh, there are so many resources and it all depends on the community you're coming from. But it's definitely first and foremost about relationship development. And maybe it's also talking to those people that you have on staff first um, and uh, asking them how they might want to be included as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So Sarah has a question here. So Sarah is asking, could you speak a bit about your experience interacting with people that have a very different viewpoint on reconciliation than you? What are some of the techniques and tips that you might have uh, used for discussing reconciliation with those that may have strong opposed feelings, um, uh, strong and opposed feelings towards it? Um, I think that we need to acknowledge that reconciliation is hard, first and foremost, that reconciliation is contested throughout the country. Um, but more so that, how have my interactions been with people who don't believe in reconciliation or who don't support reconciliation? Um, honestly, not very different from my interactions with people who do. I think it's about honoring where people are at within their own journey. You can't force someone to join reconciliation. You can give them the information and then they choose whether or not they want to be a part of this movement. Um, what it boils down to is reconciliation is about creating a more just society, a more equitable society for ourselves, for our children, for our next generations. Um, if that's not something people are interested in, I don't know if there's any way you can convince them otherwise. Um, I think that a lot of times when people oppose reconciliation, they oppose it from a government standpoint. They think that um, you know the government has made promises and they haven't fulfilled them and therefore reconciliation isn't possible. And that's what we hear a lot of the time. You know, no reconciliation without. Um, you know, Reconciliation Canada comes from a different standpoint. We believe that reconciliation is first and foremost an internal process. And it's something you have to learn to live before you can go out and share the message of reconciliation. Um, and a lot of the times it is just honoring people where they're at along their journey. I think that's very wise. Um, Alexandra is asking a question. How do we ensure that non-Indigenous individuals who are fighting for optimum potential and shared prosperity also balance their power and privilege? How does one support the building of capacity while respecting and acknowledging our own power and privilege? Oh, that's such a great question. I think it's about creating space for Indigenous voices and creating space um, whether it's within your organization or within your community for Indigenous people. How are Indigenous peoples represented? Um, you know, who are you speaking for someone? Oh, or are you letting them speak for themselves? Um, how do you support capacity building while respecting and acknowledging power and privilege? It's about creating space for Indigenous people and Indigenous voices. Um, so I'm going to uh, turn us back to some of the pre, uh, pre-webinar questions that were submitted. Um, and I, I might start with the, the first one. And I, I think it's, it's a little bit um, an interesting question, but also I think a difficult one to answer. But the question was, what is the clearest way to explain what reconciliation is and why it's important for our non-Indigenous people to be engaged without seeming rude. Sorry, Liz, can you read that one more time? What is the clearest way to explain what reconciliation is and why it's important for non-Indigenous people to be engaged without seeming rude? Um, I think the clearest, I, I, I wish there was a really simple way um, and there was a, a one sentence definition that we could all buy into on reconciliation. Um, the clearest way to define what reconciliation is, is that it's not only an acknowledgement of our sometimes dark shared Canadian history, um, but more so it's, it's the embodiment of Namoyut and an acknowledgement of our common humanity. Um, 
and an ideal that we just want to move forward together in society with more love, with more compassion, with more understanding. I think you've done that very well, Charlene. Thank you. I, think, I, I agree with you. I think it is a very difficult question in terms of a, a single clear uh, answer, but I think you've done a really good job at, at kind of synthesizing, you know, both the dark shared history, but the shared path forward as well that uh, that that I see as critical to reconciliation. Um, so another question is, um, are there shared values and planning approaches that most municipalities are currently, um, that most municipalities use currently that are consistent with First Nation values? And where can we find common ground for moving forward policies that are inclusive and sensitive? So I think this question really looks at, um, if you know from Reconciliation Canada's perspective, if you know of any municipalities that you know, are, are doing this in a way that um, should be recognized or, you know, are kind of leading and, and also how do we, how do we move forward? Mm -hmm. So, I think there are numerous communities across this country currently working on adopting reconciliation as one of their core values. Um, a few years ago, I was lucky enough to travel throughout BC working on a project called the 100 Reconciliation Dialogue Workshop. Um, and that was a partnership between the uh, BC Aboriginal Friendship Centres and the Union of BC Municipalities. And we traveled through 13 communities to talk about what reconciliation could look and feel like in that community, how we, um, how we implemented what it looks like. Um, I think in order to ensure that it's con like that this process is even consistent with First Nations values, it all once again, I know I sound like a broken record, it goes back to relationship development. Who are you connected to? Um, how are you connected? How are you honoring those connections? How are you honoring the land on which you work? It is, I think it is an important theme, right, to to uh, have intentionality and be deliberate and ask some uh, really kind of important questions. Carrie, um, Carrie weighed in here and said that it was okay sometimes to be rude, you know, <laughs> ask more difficult questions. And I think, uh, I think that's a good reminder, Carrie, for all of us that sometimes we do have to step up and ask those really you know, challenging questions of each other and ourselves in terms of this work. Um, here's an interesting question that was submitted in advance. How can we use food as a tool for reconciliation? Oh, that's such an amazing question. Um, so based on our colonial history, food was a weapon. Indigenous people were intentionally starved by the government, um, both on reserve and in residential schools. Uh, and to this day, our communities still struggle. So Food Secure Canada released a report a few years ago saying that 30% of Indigenous communities, Indigenous households across Canada are food insecure. Of that, 9% are severely food insecure. Um, because I have a very big interest in both food sovereignty and food security, I decided to do a little bit of research myself. Um, and I did a, a small informal poll uh, within the Squamish Nation, which is my nation. Um, and it was actually pretty devastating to get the results back. Um, just, just about 50% of respondents uh, reported that they're food insecure on a regular basis. Of that, over 20% said they were desperately food insecure on a regular basis. Um, so what can you do to support food sovereignty or food security with Indigenous communities? Um, I think there's so many ways that you can give back. I, um, you know, in our community, we're lucky we have a community garden um, and we have resources. I acknowledge that the Squamish Nation has, um, as an urban reserve, we have a lot more resources than um, rural uh, reserves would have. Um, how do you work to support it? It's it's about supporting uh, the growth of a food policy in Canada. It's 
about creating space for Indigenous people within the farming and agricultural communities and um, inviting them to be a part of it. Uh, for me, a big part of it um, has been an ownership of this process. So I've, you know, of course, grown my own garden since my daughter was quite small and I've raised her knowing how to garden, knowing how to um, grow food. And I think it's, um, there's so many ways, depending on where you are, what your organization is, that you can give back to that very, very important um, piece of work. I, it, it goes back to this idea of optimum potential. And, you know, we have to sit and ask ourselves, can we reach our optimum potential if we can't even access food, if we don't have access to clean water? Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think there are all there are ways, both small and big, right, that we can do where we not only do our individual acts of growing food and sharing food, but also the shared acts of uh, food, access to food policy and calling for that. So, yeah, I think I think it's very interesting the way that you frame that um, and also the, the data that you've uh, shared with us in terms of food sovereignty and food access. That's a uh, it is it is interwoven with uh, reconciliation, but it's also interwoven, I think, with you know um, how we engage with each other, right? Absolutely. Um, I, th I think we have one more uh, opportunity for one more question, um, and I, I'll pull this from um, the the questions that we had submitted in advance. And this one is it, it's along the same lines as the food question, but. Uh, really looks at environmental protection. And so this person is interested in the intersection between genuine reconciliation efforts and environmental protection efforts. How can they be mutually supportive? Or do you have good examples of such efforts that are, that are mutually supportive? So how can we build that into um, the conversation about uh, reconciliation? Absolutely, I think, um... Environmental stewardship is a necessary part of the reconciliation conversation. Um, we need to reimagine uh, our relationships, not only with ourselves and each other, but with our environment. How do we move to a more sustainable economy? How do we ensure that um, everything we do is done um, with love and care? Um, and, and that speaks not only to um, our economy, but um, into our personal relations with our own environment. Um, what can we do to be more connected with our environment? It's about being out there, being with it. Um, yeah. So before we leave end the question period, I just want to acknowledge that Celeste uh, shared a food and social justice resource called Well Now uh, Radical Dietitian, and we will share it. Um, thank you so much, Celeste, for sharing that with us, and we'll put it in the post-event email and share it with all the listeners. Um, so if any of you on the line or listeners um, have any additional resources that you'd like to share, having listened uh, to this conversation and also um, uh, maybe in your own reconciliation journey, we'd be happy to include them um, in the post-event email that will be going out in a couple of days. Um, looking at the time, uh, this really brings us to the end of our discussion. I want to thank you again, Charlene, for your time with us and your, your not only your very kind of thoughtful presentation, but also how you've um, tackled, I think, some really tough questions in terms of um, being raised from our, our listeners and also in the pre-event uh, email that went out. I think that, you know, my under, my kind of understanding or uh, what I've taken away from um, your answers to the questions are that it is about creating relationships and about conversation and about, you know, being open to um, not only your own journey, but the the journey of others that you're engaging with and and um, and that it is our shared, you know, our shared dark history, but also a shared path forward. So I want to thank you so much for that. Um, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm going to just uh, end with a couple of closing announcements um, in terms of uh, getting you some information about Tamarack. Uh, so we'd like, we invite you to stay in touch with 
the Tamarack Institute and Vibrant Communities Canada. You can receive the latest thinking, news, tools, and resources from the network by signing up to receive our regular newsletter or by visiting our online learning community at www.tamarackcommunity.ca. Uh, our newsletter just went out today, so uh, if you missed it, it will be available online. So, uh, But by signing up, you'll have it uh, come into your mailbox, your email box once a month. Uh, you can also learn with us in person. I'll be in Ottawa on September 17th hosting a one-day intensive workshop on uh, turf, trust, and collaboration. This workshop will provide you with simple, practical tools and approaches for building trust. Uh, participants will be able to bring these back to their collaborative efforts and renew engagement and shared ownership. Find out about the find the registration link at the bottom of your screen. Also taking place in September, join vibrant communities in the Peel region to explore innovative ways that local communities are leading the way in poverty reduction. The Eastern Regional Summit, Cities Innovating to Reduce Poverty, will welcome communities from Ontario, Quebec, and Nunavut uh, to Newfoundland's East Coast um, from September 18th to 19th, September 18th and 19th. Uh, use the registration link at the bottom of the screen. CRP members or Cities Reducing Poverty members can contact Natasha at tamarackcommunity.ca to reserve their two free seats. So uh, for those of you interested in innovating to reduce poverty, this is the event for you. Uh, register now for the Community Change Festival. Over four days, um, participants will explore the five practices that every change maker needs to move um, from idea to action. The five practices are collective impact, community engagement, community innovation, collaborative leadership, and evaluating impact. We will host workshops, open space dialogues, present tools, take you on immersive city learning tours, facilitate peer input processes, and so much more. And we're also going to weave into this a great festival atmosphere with art and music and all sorts of uh, great things. Find the registration link at the bottom of your screen for this event if you're interested in learning more or registering. In a few days, you'll receive our follow-up email, which will include a link to the audio recording of today's call, as well as the PowerPoint. We'll also um, share with you our learning opportunities that I've just mentioned. You can email Natasha at tamarackcommunity.ca to provide feedback about today's webinar. We're always trying to improve the webinar experience, and so your feedback is, uh, is very valuable to us. Thank you again for joining us today, for submitting your questions both in advance and online, and thank you so much, Charlene, for um, sharing with us uh, uh, information about Reconciliation Canada, but more importantly, um, information about uh, reconciliation and the journey, our shared journey together. So thanks, everybody.